Hello, this is Hector Valenzuela sharing a recent case of preperitoneal ETEP. Uh, in this case, we're going to see the planes of dissection, uh, zones uh, transitions, and the inan invert implication in a little bit more detail. This is the patient. She had a, a, a three centimeter umbilical hernia. She had a very symptomatic diastasis. Uh, we did a pure suprapubic access uh, in the midline with a 10 millimeter trocar. And we did a blunt dissection, just like you've seen me done in the previous cases. Now, this case, uh, I accidentally entered the retrorectus space. You see there that I am seeing muscle, and this is something that hasn't happened. So now I know I need to push uh, downwards to uh, be in the pre-transversalis, uh, pre-peritoneal uh, space. So I... Uh, pull the lens a little bit backwards, and then you see the fascia transversalis that I accidentally opened, the wrong plane and the right plane where I want to go to. Just to uh, illustrate a little bit the planes, I put in the needle, I uh, placed my right, uh, my, I mean my left hand trocar, and then my right hand trocar. And here I am doing the dissection on zone one. Uh, just like in previous cases, I'm doing this on top of the median umbilical ligament. And the maneuver here is to scrape off or, or peel away from the fascia, the peritoneum, very gently, trying not to progress too lateral so I can stay in the area where the peritoneum is thicker and it's uh, less likely to, to break. And here you're going to see a very nice uh, explanation or, or demonstration of the planes of dissection. Here you see the, the posterior rectus sheath, the arcuate line, uh, the area where you would go if you want to do a typical ribs stopa, and the area where one goes when doing preperitoneal ETEP. So I'm almost done with the dissection on zone one. Um, I am progressing very nicely, but as I get uh, higher and closer to the umbilicus, laterally the peritoneum becomes, becomes very thin. And as you're going to see, despite me trying to handle the peritoneum with uh, lots of care, I uh, accidentally open it. And this small rent uh, caused, of course, a filtration of air into the peritoneal cavity. Now, what I like about preperitoneal ETEP is that the space doesn't collapse as violently as it does on, on ribs stopa. So what I do is I just uh, press gently on the abdomen and uh, hold the peritoneum where it's thicker to pull down, and this will keep my space insufflated. There was no need to place any various needles or any uh, trockers uh, that will serve the purpose of a valve to drain the, the, the normal peritoneum. And here you see me doing the transition from zone one to zone two, which will be from the median umbilical ligament to being on top of the falciform ligament. Uh, I go around the hernia defect. And once I've done this, I create my volcano sign. And now I uh, reduce the hernia sac and the, reduce the, the, the uh, contents of the hernia that in this case was just a little bit of fat. And here I am finally making it into zone two of dissection. Now this zone is my favorite to dissect because this is where I feel the most comfortable because this is where I've been at the most. Uh, being on top of the falciform ligament, it's something that I'm used to from doing a uh, ribs stopa. So this part of the dissection goes fairly quickly. Uh, I feel comfortable that if I handle the peritoneum nicely, there aren't going to be too many rents uh, when doing the dissection on this area. And if you see, just by pushing a little bit uh, gently, I'm able to progress laterally, uh, just in order to avoid working in a very narrow space. There you see the, the hernia, the diastasis. We have to adjust a little bit the, the light. And then we keep progressing on some two of the dissection all the way up till we reach the siphoid uh, process. Now, while we're doing this, uh, I am uh, always taking into consideration these little branches of blood vessels that, if not cauterized, they're going to uh, be a little bloody and make, uh, may uh, uh, make my space a little cloudier and difficult to work at. Now, this is the hard part of the procedure, um, making the transition from zone uh, two to zone three. Uh, as I have mentioned before, by doing gentle pressing, 
uh, we always find these vertical attachments, uh, fascial attachments, from the peritoneum to the posterior rectus sheath or the, or the uh, transversalis fascia. And what I do is I will divide them sharply, no need to use any cautery or any sort of energy. And by dividing them, uh, I get the, the access to the plane where I want to do the separation of these two layers. Now, if I go lateral and uh, enough, early enough, I am going to reach the plane that you would reach when you're doing a bottoms up tar. So by reaching this plane, my job is super easy because now I can create an apex and I can cut in the center, uniting uh, or, or ampli uh, making more ample my dissection in zone three. Uh, I stop this dissection, of course, when I reach the transversus abdominus. Uh, for these kinds of hernias and these kinds of diastasis, there's no need to, to go beyond that point. But I am confident if there was a need to, to go beyond that point, I would be able to do it because that's where, where it gets easier. Uh, I repeat the same maneuver. For some reason, I'm still making more rents on the, on the left side. Um, but this is just an explanation in, of, of how to deal with these rents. You know, they, they appear, they happen. Uh, I, I just keep on my, on my same uh, motion, on my same, same train of thought, uh, go beyond them and try to find uh, the, the space where I can uh, liberate the peritoneum from the fascia. Now, again, just like we did on the, on the right side, if we get early enough, lateral enough, we're going to be able to reach this transversus abdominus uh, plane, uh, as you will do in a, in a bottoms up tar, and the dissection becomes a lot easier. Here you see that the, the rents, the looser I, I do the dissection, the easier it is going to become to, to close uh, these rents in the end which by the way, I closed in, in every case. I just don't show it because I don't think it's uh, appealing to watch uh, a lot of simple stitches taking place. This is the final dissection. You get to see the hernia defect, the diastasis, the retrorectus space in both uh, left and right hand side. And now this, this was a very, a very nice case to illustrate the inane inverting plication because this lady had quite a weakened midline she, she had a diastasis that bulged uh, a lot. And as you see, we're doing throws uh, uh, coming uh, side to side in a, in a horizontal mattress uh, fashion. Uh, I am bringing the fascia uh, with, my, with my accessory instrument into the abdomen to make sure I grasp the whole thing. Uh, I will lock the suture every now and then just to make sure that, that it's not gonna run back uh, accidentally. Uh, this I learned from, from my friend Igor Velyansky. And as you see here, uh, you can see the, both of the rectus being reapproximated, and you can see how the defect and the fascia that uh, has not been reapproximated is still bulging into the, um, in, into the outside of the cavity. Um, I kept doing this. Uh, fortunately, on this patient, I was able to, to do this plication uh, almost uh, five, six centimeters underneath the umbilicus. And this provided a, a, a very nice uh, cosmetic result in the patient. And uh, just getting to the end here, you see the plication, you see what would have been the rich uh, bulging in the subcutaneous space is now imbricated into the extra peritoneal cavity. And I am very satisfied with how things look. Uh, now it's just time to place a mesh. This is a 15 by 25 uh, simple middle weight polypropylene mesh. And this reflate the cavity and everything is laying very nice. Um, this is the final result. I think the looks in the umbilical scar are going to improve. And we did all, all of this procedure through these uh, three small incisions hidden in the pelvis. Thank you very much for watching.